by a few people. Von Ricklenhausen in 1862, Bourneville 1880, and Vogot in 1908. So this is Von Ricklenhausen. Actually, he did not describe a disease. He described the fetus uh, who died out of uh, whatever, and he discovered that he has brain regions. Uh, then came uh, Bonneville in 1880, and he actually had an epileptic patient who died and uh, post, uh, post mortem showed uh, sort of potato like masses in, his, uh, in uh, the brain of the patient. Then came Vogut in 1908, and he described the classical triad of epilepsy, mental retardation, and adenomastipation. We will allude to this later on. So what is gibberous complex? Gibberous sclerosis complex is the terminology used all over the world to describe this autosomal dominant genetic disorder. So this is the genetic disease and something like two to five million people around the world are affected by it. So the father, the mother, they can have affected uh, boys or affected girls. What is the problem with this uh, uh, mutation of genes? There are two genes genes, uh, one is uh, located at a certain locus and the other, uh, both are uh, important for maintaining cell growth and proliferation. And they are called tuberous sclerosis complex one, tuberous sclerosis complex two, two genes. And these two genes will allow the cell prolifer proliferation and that is through uh, mammalian pathway of rapamycin Again, I will allude to this later on. So the genes responsible for the protein production is hamartine and tuberine. They are the ones that would suppress the tumor formation. And once there is a genetic deformation of the hamartine and tuberine, and then tumors would grow. So it's a mutation. One of them is more common, which is the 16 gene and the other is at the ninth. So this is related to hamartine and this is related to tuberine. This is the more common, common one. So this genetic mutation will lead to inhibition of the mammalian target of rapamycin and this will result in the growth of hamartomas in any organ or tissue, as we will see. What happens? Then there will be improper differentiation and proliferation and migration of neurological cells during fetal development. That's in the CNS. Look at this. This is normal organized brain cortex. This is tuberous sclerosis complex, totally disorganized and dysmorphic uh, cortex. So you can see the normal and the tuberous sclerosis. Look at this normal. Uh, brain cortex, and here is markedly disorganized lamination, neural elements, and the glial elements. And what happens that if you take histology, you will see dysmorphic neurons. They don't look like any neuron anymore. And there are balloon cells, which are the characteristic cells of the tuberous sclerosis. So as I said, that the absence of genes lead to activation of the pathway which leads to proliferation and formation of hematoma, and this would be a multi-systemic disease. Let's see. Ophthalmological manifestation of the disease. This affects 50% of patients with tuberous sclerosis. This is very common. Once you have a tuberous sclerosis, you have to see the ophthalmologist for further details, for further examination. 50% of patients of tuberous sclerosis with the tuberous sclerosis, they have ophthalmological manifestations. Like what? Let's see. Retinal hamartomas. You can see the hamartoma there, everywhere. Again, the retinal hamartomas. Now, this is a tuberous sclerosis with optic nerve hamartoma, just sitting there. This paper from Denmark, 2015, optical coherence, optic OCT of 
a maculopathy in patients with tuberous sclerosis. Again, they're describing this on the optic nerve. What about cardiac? Cardiac can be the cause of death in these patients in addition to the CNS uh, tumors, but cardiac rhabdomyoma is a killer disease and it affects the heart of usually children, but can affect the adults too. This is cardiac rhabdomyoma. This is fetal rhabdomyoma. And this is giant rhabdomyoma left ventricle. And here we have multiple rhabdomyomas of the four chambers of the heart. In the lungs, we have the lymphangioleomyosarcoma, the LAM. Lymphangioleomyosarcoma LAM affecting the lungs like this. Again, you can see it in all these X-rays and CTs. Renal, again, 50 to 80% of patients have renal disease and it is also one of the killers in these, in these tuberous sclerosis. And the kind of uh, presentation is angiomyolipoma of the kidney or a polycystic kidney disease or renal cell carcinoma. So you can see that tuberous sclerosis is a multisystemic disease and it's a killer disease. Uh, bilateral angiomyolipoma is very bad and it's almost incompatible with life. Renal cysts and renal carcinoma. Liver also can be affected by cysts or by angiomyolipoma. The most distinct of the affection of the tuberous sclerosis patient is the dermatological findings. And this is affecting 90% of patients. And as this disease is a disease of childhood, so there is a great burden on the pediatricians and general practitioner to really understand this disease and discover the cases early on. It affects the children more. It's very disfiguring. It is very distressful. It's very painful. Look at this, adenoma sepation. It is not adenoma sepation, it is angiofibroma. And it looks like red papules which contain blood vessels on the, on the face. Look at the various manifestations of these angiofibromas in kids and in adults, if they are lucky enough to reach that age. Can present not like papules, but like plaques. And if you look at that skin, this is very important. There is hypopigmentation, not like the papules, hypopigmentation, and they deserve this, the ash leaf, like the ash leaf spots. So you can see this hypopigmentation, which is as important as the papules or the plaques on the surface of the skin. The chagrin patch like this is very important. This is usually mistaken for psoriasis, but if you look carefully, it's not psoriasis. If you open the mouth and look at the teeth, you can see that the teeth, they have enamel changes and you can see this uh, gingival fibroma, very characteristic. And it is one of the main features of this disease. Periangual and subangual fibromas, look at the nails here and the feet here of these angiomas and fibromas and the, and the, and the feet. So we are speaking about, we are speaking about, uh, it's a voice. We are speaking about the dermat dermatological affection and we are speaking about the neurocutaneous syndrome. Uh, this is a very, very interesting paper to read. Cutaneous manifestations of a tuberous sclerosis complex and the pediatrician role. There is a very important role for the pediatrician and the general practitioner to find these cases, to diagnose them, to guide them what to do. Let's look at what happens to the nervous system, which is our goal here. And there are so many uh, manifestations of this disease, but let's start with the main ones. The tubers in the cortex or subcortex, then the subependymal tubers or nodules, and then the, the main tumors, which is the SIGA, subependymal giant uh, cell astrocytoma. Let me start with the first manifestation, which is the tubers, cortical, subcortical, and the white matter, and it affects 90 to 80% of patients. So we should be able to see it 
if we look carefully. So this is tubules, as you can see, and they are usually calcified. Cortex or subcortex. Again here on the MRI, you can see them. Here, the, the cortical tubules. 90 to 100% of patients, cortical tubules. And there's something in, in addition, which is the migration lines. You can see this, the, the lines like this, the migration lines going like this, or here, or here, look at these lines. And here, and the frontoparietal area. The second common uh, manifestation of tuberous sclerosis is the subependymal nodules. Again, 95 to 100% of patients. So you can see the subependymal nodules. You can see here some cystic degeneration within the subependymal uh, nodules. You can see them here. They can be in any part of the ventricle, but we will see that they have a predilection. Look at this paper. Intraventricular lesions in tuberous sclerosis with possible association with the codate nucleus. It is definitely proven that these lesions, they take the shape of the codate nucleus, head, body, the uh, um, antrum, and the tail. Commonest part is the body and the, the head junction here. So wh wh why is that? Nobody knows. Still unclear why they develop uh, at the uh, distribution of the caudate nucleus. And they are common in this part, as I said. So one should know the anatomy of the caudate nucleus and look with these lesions whether they follow this distribution of the caudate nucleus, the head, the body, and the antral part and the tail part of the caudate nucleus. So you can see that lesions are going along the caudate nucleus. So there's some association that we don't understand. These subependymal nodules, they can calcify, as you can see. And once you see that calcification, you would ask yourself, whether a pediatrician or general practitioner or neurosurgeon, what kind of calcification is this? And it is normal, physiological, or pathological. The third part, which is our topic for today, is the SIGA, the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. And again, this is 5 to 20% of patients. But because it's very important and because it can be a killer, we have to address it. It's benign lesion, it's an astrocytoma, and it's grade 1. On CT, as I said, they could be calcified, they could be not. They could be small, they could be large. Again, MRI would show you that this is concentrating around the foramen of Monroe and associated with subependymal nodules. So you may find the subependymal giant astrocytoma and the subependymal nodules and the cortical and subcortical uh, tubules. And uh, T1 with contrast, you can see the SIGA here uh, and there, and could be bilateral. And this is most dangerous. Bilateral SIGA at the foramen of Monroe can present with acute hydrocephalus and it can kill patients. Can they progress? Definitely. The natural history, they progress. As you can see here, this 21 month, 35 months. 52, 65, 74, so it's a growing. This is from uh, New York. As I said, it could be small, it could be giant like this. So once you see this, you say, oh, it is not a tuberous is closed, it's not a SIGA, it can be very giant. It can calcify, as we said, like the sub uh, appendum and the jewels. And you can get hemorrhage into these uh, tumors, which can also present with acute manifestations. Paper from Japan. PET scan would show you decreased activity. And FDG PET uh, again will show you focal reduction. So this is a focal reduction here. 
hypometabolism here, here, there. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, this beautiful paper from uh, Mayo Clinic, the ability of high field strength seven Tesla to uh, reveal uh, previously uncharacterized brain lesions in patients with tuberous sclerosis. Uh, seven Tesla uh, from uh, Mayo Clinic published in London New Surgery. And uh, they have put uh, the 1.5 Tesla images and they show you the seven Tesla showing more lesions that you did not see on 1.5. 1 1.5 Tesla and the seven Tesla. You have seen lesions that you did not see on 1.5. Same here. See this, you see this, but here you see more details and more information. And the same here. So seven Tesla, although it is still in the research, I think it is starting to sell as uh, for clinical use in the United States. So how do you diagnose tuberous sclerosis? You need two major features or one major and two minor. Two major, one major or two minors. Let's see. The major ones, as we said, the facial adenoma uh, suppression or angiofibroma, the subangual fibroma, uh, the chagrin patch, which I described, the forehead fibrous plaque, the cortical tubers, the subependymal nodules, the uh, bilateral renal angiolipomas. These are major criteria. Look, all these in the various parts of the body. And this bilateral renal angiolipoma is very, very characteristic. The minor features are polycystic kidney, single renal angiolipoma, pulmonary lymphangial hypomatosis, or a cardiac rhabdomyoma. So you need two majors or uh, one major or two, one major and one minor. What about the pathology? Uh, this is the uh, pathology done by my uh, colleague, Dr. Samu Farsakh. We've been doing this together for a very long time and we have published many papers. And uh, this is one of these specimens, a gross appearance. And again, as I said, he will show you this morphic neurons, the balloon cells and so on. Uh, these are balloon cells with some uh, fatty adipose tissue. The NC is positive. The gems are for mast cells showing these mast cells in here. The GFAP is positive. Synaptocene is positive. S100 is positive. DMA obviously is negative. KI usually is low because these are benign lesions. So what is the clinical manifestations of these uh, cases? As I said before, epilepsy, 80% of cases, autism, 25 to 40%. So whenever you have an autism child, try to look for a very strong association with the tuberous sclerosis and do the most sophisticated MRI to join the link between the autism and the tuberous sclerosis. Of course, it's always associated with developmental delay, bad school um, uh, progress and so on. But the commonest is epilepsy. If you see one case of these uh, uh, tuberous sclerosis uh, regions, what is their differential diagnosis? I'll take you to this very interesting uh, slide. Frequency of intraventricular tumors, 20% ependymoma, 20% astrocytoma, meningioma, scoloid cyst, scoloid plexus papilloma, central neurocytoma, subependymoma, and miscellaneous, which is very small, is the subependymal germ cell astrocytoma. Again, you have to be aware, are you, are you dealing with a child or an adult? And where is the tumor located? And your home or body or trigone or foramen moro or third ventricle. So each has a predominance, uh, like here in foramen of moro. In a child, the SIGA is commoner than in children than in adults. And once you see calcification, as I said, this disease can present with subbendimal nodules or SIGA, which are calcified. So I have to know the differential diagnosis of calcification, which could be normal physiological in the basal ganglia like this, and the choroid plexus, and the pineal gland, 
or it could be due to hyperparathyroidism, or it could be to various diseases, calcification, influenza, in malaria, in HIV, in toxoplasmosis. The comments, as I said, are ependymomas on the region of the foramen of Monroe, 16 year old male patient, a patient of mine, another patient of mine with this ependymoma. Again, here, look, shunt has been put, and I will allude to this. I find it very, very strange that people put a shunt for all these interventricular lesions for no good reason. If, if, if they have this tumor in their children, boys or girls, they would not accept to put a shunt. Putting a shunt is a sign of weakness of the surgeon because he does not know what's the next step. If he has put an external drain, then he has a next step to do, which is accession of the tumor. But once he has a put a shunt, meaning that he closed the file, he is not gonna do anything further. So for me, putting a shunt in intraventricular tumor is a sign of weakness and incompetence. Patient of mine, 34 year old with a societal grade one, again at the foramen of Monroe. Various pilocytic astrocytomas uh, in my series, astrocytoma grade two, all these cases are cases of mine, astrocytoma grade three, cordoid glioma, it is not mine from an um, from an, uh, uh, book, oligodendroglioma, intraventricular meningioma, colloid cyst, which I presented last week, and this is one of the largest colloid cysts in literature, patient of mine. Coroid plexus tumors, be it a coroid plexus papilloma or uh, malignancy or the aggressive type, which is a grade two. A neurocytoma, central neurocytoma, a patient from Sudan. Again, various neurocytomas, I had the pleasure of dealing with them. Uh, this patient of mine is a nurse, a Jordanian nurse, 30 year old male patient with this tumor, central neurocytoma, subependymoma, and this man from Iraq. This is Jordanian lady with subependymoma. So we have the astrocytoma, we have the ependymoma, we have the subependymoma, and we have the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. So all these can present with tumors around the foramen of Monroe. Craniopharyngioma, 5% of them, they are isolated completely inside the third ventricle. Germinomas, and look at this one girl I had from Iraq, 11 year old, but this is a huge tumor at the foramen of Monroe, and that turned out to be a germinoma. We did excise it and gave it radiotherapy, and she's now what about 18 year old, about nine year follow up without any recurrence. Yolk sac tumor, the same like germinoma, peanut, primary neuroectodermal tumors at the region of the foramen of Monroe, and lymphoma. And people would think that lymphoma would not present intraventricular, they can. And this is one case of mine, 10 year old girl from Kurdistan with this uh, Kurdistan Iraq, with this huge tumor intraventricular that turned out to be uh, lymphoma. This is the histology. Intraventricular metastasis, again, people think that metastasis would not be inside the ventricle, they can be. I have seen them, I have dealt with them. Cavernoma inside the, uh, the foramen of Monroe. Teratoma, Corpus callosum lipoma, as you can see here. And here, the epidermoid and dermoid in the region of the foramen. Tuberculoma, especially in the Middle East, in Yemen and in other countries, we have intracranial tuberculomas. Sarcoidosis follow. Cystosarcosis, look at this. You can easily miss this for uh, any other of the uh, differential diagnoses that I mentioned. Histocytosis X loves the area in the uh, cellular, supracellular area. Aneurysm, if you are not careful, basilar tip aneurysm can really be there at the foramen of Monroe. 
So you can see that the differential diagnosis is wide, and I always recommend the young neurosurgeons and residents to have a long list of follow of differential diagnosis and then try to see three or four uh, limited options of the diagnosis. What's the treatment of this uh, SIGA? Either you observe or you do surgery or you give pharmacotherapy, which is the MTOR inhibitor, uh, the mammalian uh, track of the uh, rapamycin, radiation therapy, or a gamma knife. Observation, if you have a case uh, which is asymptomatic and there is no uh, fear of actually observing and doing serial imaging. Surgery, uh, your aim as in another tumor to eradicate, but sometimes you have to accept defeat and leave a tumor there. And luckily, literature tells us once you leave a small piece, it rarely grows again. Somehow it is suppressed and does not grow again. Of course, there are cases of recurrence, but I will show you in many of my cases there has been no recurrence in leaving a small part, which is, as you can have seen it from the previous lecture, is difficult to remove from the area of the foramen of Monroe, from the fornix, and from the other uh, nuclei there. So complete resection is difficult in some cases because of attachment to important structures. Look in paper, uh, this is a paper by Yezergil and uh, Salim Abdelrauf. At that time, uh, Yezergil was still at Little Rock and uh, Salim has moved to uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And they are showing this tumor intraventricular done by Walter Dandy. Uh, paper from Poland, what a surgical treatment of the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. Conclusion. Their study indicated that subependymal giant cell astrocytoma is associated with significant risk in which individual? Bilateral and tumors bigger than two centimeters and in children. So these are the criteria of difficulty and where you have to leave a small piece of the tumor. And they have put this sketch here. As I said, the tuberous sclerosis complex one, tuberous sclerosis complex two, and you can see the complication rate is higher in this uh, complex number two and in younger age of patients and in the large size of the tumor. This paper from France, surgery for subependymal giant astrocytoma, they describe 18 patients over a period of 10 years. They have done microsurgery in 17, endoscopy in one, and they have recurrence in three. What are the approaches? Many approaches for the ventricular system, depending on where the tumor is, but most of the time, SIGA is around the foramen of Monroe, and the approaches are either transcortical or transcalosal. Uh, transcortical, as you can see, the idea is to go through the uh, sulcus between the severe and middle frontal gyrus or through the middle frontal gyrus with inclination to go into the ventricular cavity like this. And this is the, some of the MRIs of my patients the, showing the point of entry. Again, here you can see point of entry here, here, there, there, and there. And this is the transcortical, you can see, going into the corpus, uh, going into the ventricular system. So cortical incision and then deep in, into the pendima. And uh, here, uh, uh, Arung uh, Koen Gado described this paper showing that he's using this introducer uh, to do the job. Transcalosal, same, go through the midline. And we have seen this in the previous lecture. Uh, Pablo showed it it's just the same. You have to find. Uh, actually, Pablo described a very good technique, which I use. I leave this vein like this, and I cut the dura here. And I cut the dura here and reflect it. So you keep the vein if it is going into the dura intact. If it is not going into the dura, then just arachnoid dissection will give you that space. And once you go in, you see the pericalosal artery. You split the corpus callosum about 1 to 1, 1.5 centimeters, and then you get into the ventricular system. So this is transcalosal. You cross the midline. As you can see here, this is sagittal sinus. Again, you would find the vein, which I described what to do with them. In this case, I just cut the dura this way 
in this way and leave the uh, vein intact into the callosum. You can see the pericallosum and callosum marginal. Here they are. You go in between, find the white color of the corpus callosum, one to 1.5 uh, incision in the corpus callosum to avoid any dissociation between the two hemispheres. And then you are into the ventricular cavity. Uh, again, this is transcalosal. You go right or you go left, but most of the time, whenever I go transcalosal, I find myself on the left side. And once you go through the, the corpus callosum, you can go paraphornoceal or transchoroidal or interphornoceal according to where you want to go. So here we are, formula of Monroe, thalamus to eight, septal vein, and you go in here. Again, thalamus to eight, septal vein, and you go in here. This is the tinea for nieces. So this is thalamus to eight, septal vein, superior choroidal vein, choroid plexus, and then you cut here through the tinea for nieces to go into the third ventricle. I want to elaborate on this shunt. I keep saying that this is a disease in the underdeveloped countries where a shunt is put in anybody who's having any ventricular obstruction for no good reason. As I said, putting a shunt for intraventricular tumors, maybe this is the treatment, maybe eventually this is the treatment, but it should not be put up front. And the argument that people use is that this was an emergency at three o'clock in the morning. So we did not want to do major surgery. Okay, a shunt will take time. External ventricular drain will take no time. So put an external drain. But as I said, once you have put a shunt, you have closed the file. You have no further step to do. You are not gonna do any further craniotomy for accession. So I know you are incompetent. Look at this here. The thing will grow. And the shunt is there making uh, surgery difficult. Shunt lesion growing further. Again, large one with the, with the shunt. Again, I mean, there is no explanation for me except for incompetency of the surgeon who is doing it. And the worst scenarios of all is the bilateral shunt. And people would speak about why shape connection and they are describing as if they are describing a battle. Uh, uh, why shape connection and I put bilateral shunt. This is crazy. And to me, this is a crime against humanity. Endoscopy, as I said, in the hands of the endoscopist lies the future of a neurosurgery. And there have been many descriptions of uh, the endoscopy used for interventricular lesions. The limitation in endoscopy is that these lesions are very vascular and they would bleed heavily. So maybe endoscopy for these cases is not the first choice, but it's in, in the good hands. It is one of the choices to go for. Radiotherapy outcome is disappointing. They are using the laser interstitial thermal therapy now uh, for treatment. And this is some of the papers I published from USA. The uh, MRI guided laser interstitial thermal therapy, as you can see, the treatment here and six months later, it is surrounded by this uh, uh, killer area or killed area. Another paper from USA about the laser interstitial thermal therapy used for this, for treatment and after treatment. Gamma knife, there's uncertainty about its efficacy and lack of safety over the 20 years period when did Lansford Group treated only six patients with, with these cases. So these are limited for recurrent tumors. Uh, as I said, the pharmacotherapy is to use the pathway inhibitor, Everolimus or Tesmirolimus. This is FDA approved the drug and it can affect these uh, cases. This is before treatment, this is after treatment, before treatment, three months later, 36 months later. So there is a pharmacotherapy for this. Another paper from USA about Everolimus for tumor recurrence here before and here after, before and after the pharmacotherapy. 
So this is the one that we described as the uh, rapamycin pathway, mammalian target of rapamycin. Uh, the, the limitation of the everlimus is that once you stop treat, treatment, the tumor may regrow and you need to use it for a long period of time. It has many side effects. Another paper from mainly USA about the efficacy of this before and after. Now, uh, last portion of my presentation to tell you about my series. I had 11 cases. I was so lucky to have this number in the years 90 to uh, 2020, about 30 years period to have 11 cases of SEGA is very important. I've lost five cases for follow-up, so I'm going to present to you the six cases which I have followed and I have uh, documentation of. For all patients, we do full ophthalmological examination, including optic OCT, visual fields, fondoscopy, etc. Uh, we need to know it before and after treatment. We send all patients for genetic testing uh, and we do neuropsychology assessment. We do skull X-ray and you'll be surprised that skull X-ray is still very useful and you can see the silver beaten appearance because of the hydrocephalus. We do the MRI, the various MRI sequences, MRA, MRV, and for me, MRI means brain MRI, brain MRA, brain MRV, they are one and the same unit. It's very important to know the location of vessels and the bridging veins. And we also go for systemic investigations if we are in doubt, chest X-ray, and to look into the spine if we are thinking of any dissemination. Uh, so I performed microsurgery in six cases and they were all transcortical and I have long follow up on them. I always end the surgery by putting external drain to safeguard against any blood clot that would close the aqueduct or whatever to make sure that there is no need for a shunt. Complications, of course, like any other uh, neurosurgeon, I have the subdural hygroma, bilateral uh, sub the allele collection, meningitis, the uh, eye, hemiparesis, and so on. A list of cases. I started this case, 18-year-old female uh, who is a Jordanian residing in the United Arab Emirates. She had epilepsy at the age of two. At that time, in the United Arab Emirates, they have done this MRI, which did not show uh, any abnormality. At the age of seven, she was still having seizures. She had poor school performance. And the MRI then at the age of seven years showed this lesion. Nothing was done. At the age of 17, she had larger lesions with hydrocephalus. Nothing has been done. And you can see that she developed this huge uh, dilatation of the ventricle, especially on the left side. But if you look at the MRI, you can see that this lesion is really going into foramen of Monroe, affecting the uh, uh, the columns of the fornix and in the uh, deep areas of the anterior horn of the uh, lateral ventricle. And again, you can see it here and in here. So. This is a story to tell, really, and, and I would just want to, to you to, 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 to go with me into the understanding of how these tumors behave. This lady came from uh, United Arab Emirates on an airplane. She arrived to the airport. We sent an ambulance to bring her. She just arrived, just put her in her bed, and she arrested with fixed dilated pupil on the right side. CT scan on the way to the theater showed this. We have put external ventricular drain. Extended ventricular drain takes 10 minutes max. You don't put a shunt in emergencies. So to tell me that I had to put a shunt because it was an emergency at three o'clock in the morning, my answer to this, put external drain. But you do not want to put external drain because you have another step to take which you don't want to take. 
So this is the CT scan and this is the external drain we have put, saving her life. Having recovered, we assessed her from the psychological point of view. Our uh, associate, our uh, uh, psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Walid Sarhan, who is a very senior uh, psychiatrist in Jordan and in the Arab world, performed the Karnofsky performance scale and he's done other things. And he decided that her Karnofsky was 50. She requires considerable assistance. <coughs> Sorry, her IQ is 60 with my mental retardation. Interpersonal sensitivity and anxiety as mild high score. Uh, we did surgery for her, and this is the immediate postoperative MRI, and this is the postoperative course of the patient. My observation of this lady was fair in color. She had fair hair, fair skin, and she had colored eyes, which may be something. Uh, this is not common in Jordanians to have this uh, kind of color. Uh, so here she is, did very well. And we followed her and at four years of follow-up, still this was seen and follow-up MRI did not show any changes in that. Confirming the opinion which I'm making that if you remove the major part of the tumor, the residual part and most of the times will not grow. Did I give radiotherapy? No, I did not. I would not. Uh, believe me or not, believe me or you don't believe me that this is the sister of the first uh, girl. The first girl was 18 year old. This is her elder sister, 20 year old female, Jordanian, residing with her husband in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And this is her MRI, you can see, almost same like her sister. And again, another story. She came by airplane, we sent her an ambulance, ambulance just arrived to the ICU and she arrested and we had to put an external drain. And this is after surgery when we removed her tumor and this is two years follow up. Residual lesion, which is not affecting her by any means. And this is her again doing very well. Now, this is the story I want to tell you. This is a Jordanian uh, uh, girl residing in Jerusalem and the West Bank of Jordan with the Palestinian Authority. And uh, she's married, she's pregnant, and uh, she wants to deliver. So they have put an epidural. And with the epidural, she arrested. Why? Because she had severe hydrocephalus with this. How did she survive? I have no idea. She survived by some means and she was brought to us with this uh, huge tumor. Again, we did the surgery and this is the immediate post-operative. And this is the follow-up of the very small residual, which I did not remove because it was attached to the uh, furnaces, to the columns of the furnaces. Uh, this is the girl herself, and this is the follow-up. She's doing very well. She is now residing in Jericho, the West Bank of Jordan. <clears throat> uh, this is the story to tell. Jordanian family with the three sons affected. The three sons of the same family, Christian family. By the way, 18% of Jordanian people are Christians. Christians, Muslims, and Jews have been living in this area for so many uh, centuries without any problem. Jordan is a very uh, religious tolerant country. So this uh, Christian Jordanian family, I uh, got this picture for you, three sons. This is the elder son, the middle and the youngest. Uh, again, the first child presented to me as an emergency. This is the elder son. When I saw him, I asked to see the rest of the family the, this is the, uh, the, sorry, this is the female, this is the male. So the mother is a carrier. And this is the elder brother, middle brother, and young brother. So the elder brother presented to me as a very top emergency, which we did for him. And this is the uh, immediate post uh, operative. We, did not, we don't go to all the sub ependymal nodules, we go for the uh, culprit for the one which was causing the hydrocephalus. And 
I followed the elder brother. Uh, I received him 88 as an emergency. I followed them up till 2008. And uh, unfortunately, he committed suicide. He wanted to get married and he could not find um, a girl to get married because of his uh, disease. So he committed suicide. Uh, I brought the middle brother and did CT scan on him and he, he had also hydrocephalus and I operated upon him. Same year, post-operative, still subependimentodules, which we did not touch. Again, we followed him up till 2018. That is 30 years of follow-up without any radiotherapy, whether for the elder brother or the middle brother. For 20 and 30 years, we did not give any radiotherapy. The youngest brother follow-up did not show, except for increased number of uh, subependimentodules sub without causing any problems for them. And this is the follow-up for 30 years. We followed the mother, the number of sub nodules increased. She's a carrier, remember? The father remained uh, free. And this is the picture for the family 29 years later. We published this in the Pan Arab Journal of Neurosurgery uh, as a very unique case of three members of the same Jordanian family. Before we go into surgery, to remind you of some of the anatomical features, to go into that area, you have to have a full knowledge of the anatomy of the ventricular system, especially the, the third ventricle and the fourth, the, the lateral ventricle, the roof and the interior floor and uh, all the walls of the lateral and uh, third ventricle. Uh, this is the corpus callosum and this is the uh, fornix. And this is the choroid plexus in the roof of the third ventricle. This is for Emil of Monroe. And this is again the body of the fornix here. And you can see the anterior septal vein coming this way. The uh, thalamus straight comes this way. Uh, it will be joined by the several choroidal vessel and they will form the internal cerebral vein. So removal of part of the corpus callosum on this cadaveric specimen, you can see anterior septal joining with the thalamus straight to form the internal cerebral vein. A frontal view of the ventricular system, you have to have this 3D imagination of the anatomy. If you are looking from the spear aspect and then looking at the both ventricles, then coming to the area of foramen of Monroe, you can see the septal vein, the thalamostraid vein. Here, uh, hidden underneath the body of the uh, uh, corpus callosum with the, with the septum lacidum on top is the internal cerebral vein. So here you are. Septal thalamus triate, septal thalamus triate forming internal cerebral vein, superior choroidal vein, superior choroidal vein. Same picture here. Uh, this is the uh, fornix uh, coming from right side, left side, joining together to form the body of the fornix. So, cross from the left, cross from the right, body of the fornix and the columns of the fornix. Same picture here, the body of the fornix hiding uh, to us the uh, roof of the third ventricle, septal vein, thalamus triad vein. Here we have removed part of the body of the fornix on the right side. As you can see, septal vein, thalamus triad here. This is the branches of the medial posterior choroidal artery. Again, showing the same features as we described. So you should not go into that area unless you know the exact anatomy. Be studied in textbooks and then go to the cadaveric lab and then you might venture to go into that area. Uh, intraventricular lesions, especially in the third ventricle, especially in the foramen of Moro are very challenging. Again, you have to understand the vascular relationship. The septal vein, the thalamus straight vein comes from the anterior, middle and posterior caudate veins and forming the internal cerebral vein. And then here the vein of Rosenthal to form the vein of Gallen. I always refer to this um, uh, view from Yazar Jil book about this uh, 3D imagination of how these veins are connected and tereoceptal thalamus triate, tereoceptal thalamus triate forming internal cerebral vein here, internal cerebral vein here, vein of Rosenthal joining us. So you need to know all this. And 
you need to know uh, the muscular relationship with the foramen of Monroe. Here you can see the internal cerebral veins, the thalamus triad vein, the septal vein, and so on. So important knowledge of the anatomy that you need. And also you have to be familiar with the uh, relationship of the anterior septal vein and thalamus triad vein. Here is the normal side, here is the abnormal. Uh, and the anterior septal and thalamus triad. Look here how they join, look here, look here, and look here. So they have different angles of uh, um, anastomosis together. So always I'm referred to reading from textbooks, whatever textbook you like. Uh, Roton or uh, Gezergeel or Sweet, whatever you like, but read from textbooks and do not read from handbooks. Please, for goodness sake, don't read from handbooks. Leave this handbook, which is by its name, it's called handbook. It is something you read the night of, of the exam, but don't use it as a textbook. I sometimes use the navigation uh, if I need to. As I said, I end the surgery by putting external ventricular drain for a couple of days. I will show you now some of the uh, videos and then we'll be finished. I think we are still on time. I will show you some simple cases. As I said, most of the time, these uh, tumors are very vascular. In this case, I want to show you a less vascular tumor. Here I'm opening the septum uh, lucidum, and here I'm uh, holding the tumor, which is not very vascular, which is unusual uh, from the area of the uh, foramen of Monroe. Uh, so for me, this is, was the simplest case of uh, SIGA subventimal giant cell astrocytoma in tuberous sclerosis patient. So here we are. This is the simplest case. Now we'll go for another one. Here's to show you how muscular these tumors are. This is transcortical approach, and you can see the tumor is very, very vascular, extremely vascular. You, when you touch it, it just bleed and bleed and bleed. It's full of bezels, so you don't know whether you are dealing with thalamus triad vein or septal vein, or is it just a vein of the tumor, but they are really very vascular. And here we're trying to take the tumor off the foramen of Monroe. Last piece of the tumor. And this is the area of the foramen of Monroe here and the, the coronal plexus. I always open the septum lucidum to make sure that hydrocephalus uh, would not happen postoperatively. And I ensure this by putting the uh, external ventricular drain. Now, this is just to show you that we are on the uh, right side. Here we have opened the septum. You can see the left side. And here we are opening the uh, foramen of Monroe here without encroaching on the uh, columns of the fornix. But look at here, you don't find a plane of a cleavage here. Here I'm just looking the other side. This is the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle on the other side. Here the tumor is really uh, stuck to the area of the foramen of Monroe, and I had to be careful in uh, removing it. It was not suckable, and there was no plane of cleavage. I used the COSA aspirator, and you can see that it is very vascular. So we'll continue using the, and this is the last piece here, which is attached here to the fornix. So I'm using it a very low power of the ultrasonic aspirator, just like a sucker, as, as, it, as it were.
So this is the problem with these tumors that they are stuck, no plane of cleavage in an area full of important structures, be it the codate, be it the thalamus, be it the thalamus triate, be it the columns of the fornix and so on. Wash, wash, wash to prevent any blood clots accumulating within the ventricular system and then open the septum lucidum and put an external drain. The last video and we'll be finished. Again here showing you how vascular these tumors are. This is the tumor as we have done transcortical. So it may look like sort of well encapsulated but then we'll find that as you go deeper, it has the attachment to the structures around the foramen of Monroe, mainly the caudate nucleus and the uh, columns of the fornix. Very vascular tumor. Continue with the removal of the tumor. Look here is the head of codate. And if you go in here, this, the thing that the codate looks like a tumor inside. So you have to be careful and stop. And this is the septum. This is the thalamus triate. And this is the blood vessel coming here to the tumor. Separating the tumor from the thalamus triad vein. Still a tumor, the foramen of one row here. Trying to open the, here you can see the internal cerebral vein in a minute. There it is. So thalamus straight coming this way, septal coming this way, forming the internal uh, cerebral vein. I'm cauterizing the choroid plexus to allow me to take as much of the tumor as I can. And here is the coronary plexus going into the foramen. Ends by wash, 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 and the opening the septum and putting external drain. I always close the dura in a baggy fashion. Uh, I don't like um, primary suturing because I believe that to prevent any increase in ventricular pressure, you have to have a baggy dura closure. Uh, with this, I finish and I thank you for listening. I'm happy to take your comments and questions. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dr. Sabeha. Let me just get off the screen share here. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, uh, comments or let me get my screen here. Um, any comments or questions from any of the panelists? Yeah, uh, John, uh, hi. Hi, welcome. Yeah, this is Dr. Altaf from Karachi. And uh, 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 salam, Professor Ibrahim, an excellent presentation. And you are a great speaker and a great neurosurgeon. I must appreciate. And uh, we are supposed to learn a lot from you and your experience. And I have the honor of uh, working with Professor Dr. Rashid Juma, who happens to be your uh, contemporary at St. George's Hospital, London. That's true. That's true. Uh, 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 yeah. So, I was just wondering that the two ladies had a flight and then they succumbed. Is there anything with, with the uh, pressure of air which made them to succumb when they landed? Or that, that was a kind of intriguing thought for me. The, the, the two sisters, you mean? Yes. The yes. one came when she was being shifted to hospital, she, she collapsed. And another one, same story. So do you think that the I raised ICP was compounded by the flight? I have no doubt about that. I have no doubt about that. And we must actually understand that we know very little about the effect of air travel on the brain tumors. 
we just sign certificates that this patient can fly, but really we don't go deep into writing these uh, reports. We have to be careful. Putting a patient in another plane with the brain tumor and hydrocephalus is asking for trouble, is asking for the patient to die en route. So people have to be careful. No, people did not realize this actually unless she, until she arrived here and just on arriving here with the change of the cabin pressure I mean, uh, the, the cabin pressure now in the, in, in the uh, airplanes that we have now is, 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 is stable, but you go up and down, you go up and down, so the parametric pressure changes, and there are changes on the intracranial pressure, and it is the cause of deterioration of these uh, two systems. Right. So I, I completely agree with your uh, analysis. So second question is, have you ever tried mTOR inhibitor in your in your patients? Used what? mTOR. What is it? mTOR. mTOR. mTOR inhibitor. The tetralimus. No, I didn't. No, I did not. As I said, the the uh, teaching about these papers that it is a hefty drug. It has lots of side effects. Although it is FDA approved, but you have to be very careful. And once you stop it with all the side effects that it can cause, the tumor can grow again. So I think we still need more time to evaluate the efficacy of this drug. I believe that if you have a very difficult case that you could not operate or you operate and it require that you can use the pharmacotherapy for these patients. Right. And uh, you also advise that uh, these patients should also be followed for the lesions in other organs, including kidney and uh, retina. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and for the brain itself, you have to keep long follow up on them because they can develop other uh, lesions or the uh, pre existing subpendium and can grow. So they have to be under monitor all their lives. And how often do you see the um, uh, spinal lesions in these patients? Have you seen the spinal no, lesions? No, I haven't. I haven't. It is reported that there are some uh, bony changes in the spine and some, sometimes we have some uh, migrations of cells, but I have not seen any case of spinal uh, lesions in these uh, patients of tuberous sclerosis. And now my last question and kind of comment. Have you ever noticed, or have you have you any idea about um, conversion of these tumors into malignancy, or association of this disease with malignancy? Yeah, it has been reported, but I have not seen personally. It has been reported that they can turn into aggressive or malignant uh, cases uh, simply by chronicity. Chron chronic uh, uh, or the time of a chronicity is one factor of tumors going high grade leave a low grade glioma, most likely it will go into grade two or grade three. And I believe the same would happen with these uh, SEGA lesions. Uh, so chronicity is an important point. But we tend, I lost it, sorry, sorry. But we tend not to operate until they become symptomatic. Yes, in there, has been a, there has been a paper, paper or two papers advocating that once you see a lesion which you think is SEGA, although it is asymptomatic, you go and remove it. But lots of people reading the comments of the authors, to comments to the authors about this, that this is not really on, this is a rather crazy approach, that you go and operate on something which is asymptomatic. You have to keep them under close monitoring, and it is the duty of the uh, pediatrician and the general, um, general practitioner to see these cases preschool and that school. But people are missing on this part, uh, especially in the, the underdeveloped uh, countries, people are missing on these lesions. Right, and removing the tumor will not uh, uh, cure the epilepsy. It has, nothing to do with, it has nothing to do with the epilepsy, uh, but removing it is life-saving as, as I've shown uh, with the hydrocephalus but it has nothing to do with epilepsy. Thank you very much, sir. Pleasure. Hey, thank you, uh, Dr. Ali, for your participation. Sam or Hose, how are you doing?
Do you have a comment or question? Hi, John, and thank you, Dr. Ibrahim, for the nice presentation. I'm Samar Hoss from Iraq. Uh, actually, just uh, I have a, an idea in mind that uh, uh, in the colloid cyst, which uh, uh, closes uh, uh, um, like a close uh, disease to the SIGA, the subacute uh, giant uh, epidemic, is uh, uh, once a few reports about sudden death and the colloid cyst reported, just the trend of colloid cyst shift that even small, even symptomatic should be treated surgically as soon as possible because of risk of death. That's, that's my, maybe in, for the future, if any reports about sudden death from SIGA, that maybe change the, the strategy, even though we know that SIGA in most of the instances, larger in size, at the presentation than colloid. That's sure. your opinion, sir. Yeah. Last week I presented the colloid cysts and I looked into literature and found that all through the uh, literature uh, presentation, only 104 cases of sudden death occurred due to colloid cyst. So uh, to think that colloid cyst is going to cause sudden death is not realistic, mm. right? It is not realistic at all. Mm. 10% of intraventricular tumors are colloid cysts. So to operate on these just because they are there is not, is not a good uh, policy. But we have to keep patients under, under observation. We have to tell them what to do. We have to tell them what are the symptoms and signs that when they develop, they have to come to us. Uh, I mean, this is my policy. I would not operate on something which is asymptomatic and something that for the time being is not causing any problem for the patient. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Samer. Uh, Abdullah, do you, say you had a question or comment? Good evening. Uh, good, good evening, Dr. Bennett. Uh, good mm -hmm. evening, Dr. Ibrahim. How are you? Uh, thank you very much for your uh, elaborated uh, uh, lecture. Actually, this disease is, uh, is, 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 a, is a dilemma for plenty of, of, of doctors. And the problem that, uh, as you say, nobody is following and uh, seeing the extension of the symptoms and uh, uh, manifestations of such disease. Uh, anyway, well, I, I don't want to advocate. I'm, I'm, I'm like you. I don't like just to start with the half treatment or even with the, with a small procedure for something which is serious uh, and and go for, uh, for small procedures just to uh, take money or... Uh, I mean, start something and say, okay, I treated your symptoms and you go somewhere else, or you don't go somewhere else to be treated. But uh, going back to your two cases, which they had arrested already, or three cases which they had arrested, I think. Huh? Sure. Well, uh, uh, maybe maybe you don't have an idea. I'm, I'm, I'm living in, in, in Saudi Arabia, and you know that. Uh, there are plenty of difficulties in the insurance problems and uh, eligibility problems for patients who are coming to hospitals or uh, even to medical, uh, big medical centers, where can they have uh, complicated surgeries actually, or complex surgeries, let's say. So, as I said to you, I'm not advocating, but at least if such patients would have had VP shunts, maybe they wouldn't have arrested uh, and would have reached to you uh, to get operated in their countries uh, in a safer uh, position. After that, we can remove the VP shunt. Well, uh, I know you don't like the shunt. I know you don't like the tubes. But sometimes when the social or the economic or the uh, even the will of the patient, I mean, there are plenty of patients who are expatriates who doesn't like to get operated while they are in their expatriate country and they want to go to their family to get operated there. We have plenty of them, like mm -hmm. uh, Indian patients, like uh, Bengalis, like uh, even even Filipinos, who likes to go back to their country between their family members to get their care there for their major surgeries there, and then to go. I cannot, as you said, allow a patient with hydrocephalus with a high risk of uh, of, of uh, boning during a, a, a long trip to change. Well, at that moment, I may offer the patient a VP shunt and let him go, okay? Uh, depends on the circumstances, as I said. If I can go and get operating this patient here, I will not leave him. But 
this is the only case maybe I can just defend the idea of doing VP shunts for some patients. What do you think about that? I know you hate it. I know maybe that's going to affect maybe your surgery. That sure. may be going to make a little bit difficulty. Uh, sure. But uh, let me hear from you again. Thank you for raising this point. It's very important and it is really uh, um, affects me so deeply to see shunts put in this part of the world. I believe strongly that uh, shunt and the Middle East and the underdeveloped countries and the Arab countries is a disease in itself. Residents are taught to put the shunt for all kinds of lesions without thinking. And when you look at the uh, operative uh, experience of the somebody presenting to, to go into the exams of the Arab board or the Jordanian board, and you look at the, how many cases have you done? He would tell you 300 cases. And you would look carefully and you will find that uh, there were 100 shunts and there were 100 revision of shunts of the upper end and 100 of revision of the lower end of the shunt. This is, should not be the case. We should not teach them that the shunt is the disease, is the, the treatment for all the cases. And the most awful is to put bilateral shunts. I agree with you, Abdullah, if what you have said is the exception. But this is the rule. This is the rule. And when you ask them, why did you put a shunt in the middle of the night? You would say it's an emergency, right? You can put an external drain, it's a quicker. And then you can refer them to another surgeon to do. But as you said, it's for money. It is for not taking the courage to do the further step of doing the surgery. If he has put an external drain, then he's committed to do the surgery for the patient, which he can't. So we have to, I mean, there is no country in the world that where, where you don't have neurosurgeons who cannot remove a colloid cyst or, or a, a seagull or whatever. There are, but people are not happy to refer patients to the other experienced surgeons and they put a shunt, which makes my life and the life of the patient miserable and, you know, lots of problems with the care. I, I, I told you, I agree totally with you with the concept, but in special circumstances, okay. which happened with your three patients, yes. I mean, yes. I, I, would have, I would have put VB shunt for the patient and send him uh, with a trip of two or three, four, yeah. you know, no trip, no trip in the airport will take less than six hours. Yeah, but they, why, could why, have why? Been, they could have been also sent with an external drain, rather uh, than. I don't think. I don't think so. Well, I, 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 me myself, I wouldn't have sent a patient with an external drainage, which is lying down with tubes. You know, uh, the legalization of sending a patient with uh, such an external drainage, uh, which needs to be adjusted for height and something like that. I think this is a little bit difficult. No. Uh, I, I, I prefer, well, I I to, prefer to, to, to send a patient with VP shunt. You can refer patients with external drain, which is a closed, but you send a nurse or a doctor with a patient. So there's no problem of sending patients it's on airplanes with external drain, which is financial, Financially and administratively concerning the airplane companies, uh, uh, plenty of them, they will refuse that. Uh, and that will be a very, very high cost on the families of the patients. You know, most of the expatriates in the Gulf countries, uh, I mean, if I'll tell you 80 to 90 percent of them are having low salaries in comparison to the high uh, medical uh, treatment costs and the insurance coverage. Uh, hence, I'm telling that if I'll be the doctor of a patient, I would do it, suppose, I had a patient, I'll offer the surgery, okay. sure. but she is not covered by insurance. She's refusing to do it here. Uh, there is something. My second offer to her will be, I'll do a VP shunt and send you to Dr. Subeh. I agree with you that these are special circumstances and I would accept this argument, but this is not being carried out. In the same country, without the trouble, people are putting shunts. So what you are saying is a special- no, in same no, in same country, this is not acceptable. Yeah. I agree with you. Thank you. Okay, okay. Let's move. Let's move on. Jalal has a comment. Go ahead, Jalal. Hello, everybody. Hello, Dr. Subeh. It's uh, great to see you again. Hi. Thank you for your nice lecture. Thank you, Jalal. Uh, actually, I, uh, I had a comment that if you if you treat a colloid cyst, especially in the VP shunt, uh, I think it's uh, there's no need to send it to, to Professor Subeh or others because you close all the other uh, way for treatment. Uh, the the main the main treatments now is endoscopic, which is take time 
maybe uh, the, uh, as you puncture your the ventricle, you can put your endoscope and give the patient chance or give it the external drainage. But the VB shunt, it's treatment of hydrocephalus, not the treatment of the colloid cyst. So Absolutely. we are uh, cheating our, uh, and you close the way for the patient to cure for the colloid cyst itself. Absolutely. Uh, I, I have a comment because, because you, last week I did not attend your lecture alive, but I, I attended on that YouTube for uh, yeah. in your surgical TV. Uh, you mentioned my name in the reference as uh, with, uh, it's, I'm proud of that. Uh, with 18 uh, cases of colloid cysts. Yes. For, uh, yeah, but I don't know from where you get it because we published with Professor Al Mufti in controversy of neurosurgery in his book, 28 cases with a uh, follow up of about 15 uh, years. So, yes. uh, and, and and this is, I think it's it's good for endoscopic cases for. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So uh, that's. Uh, yeah. My uh, second that point, because yeah, it is please. important paper in the treatment of colitis and uh, with your name and the name of Al Mufti, I thought it's worth mentioning. And I keep saying and I keep repeating myself that the future of neurosurgery lies in the hands of endoscopist. Endoscopy is the future of the neurosurgery. So I believe strongly in its value and its progression in the coming years. Yes, it's very important in colloid cyst because it's a vascular structure and you can Absolutely. manage it not, not like the other tumors Absolutely. with endoscope. Absolutely. Uh, my next next point is about the subendemal uh, cases. I have two cases. One uh, huge uh, tumor, I did it transcortical. Uh, and the second one is less than two centimeters. I did it uh, endoscopic and it was okay. I send it. Uh, I. Uh, uh, did this uh, some meeting in the Arab meeting? Uh, and anyway, I uh, put my uh, comments on you and on YouTube for the new research with uh, Professor Amiti. I think uh, it's better if you uh, like to yeah, add sure. it. Sure. Thank sure. you very much. Nice to see you, Jalal, and I hope you are doing well. Where are you located now? Uh, I'm actually from uh, border of the Turkish. Syrian Turkish border, my family in the uh, Turkish border, and I'm practicing in the north of Syria. Keep well and say hello to all my Syrian colleagues. I, I miss Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jalal, nice to see you. I, we have Thank met you. maybe in, 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 uh, in Damascus in the meeting on 2010, if I'm not mistaken. That when Yazir Gil was there, it was 2008. Uh, Yazir was there, and it was uh, 2008. And uh, no, 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 2008, 2010. Sorry, not 2008. Yazir Gil was not uh -huh. there. I think, uh -huh. I think maybe the it, next was the Syrian, it was the Syrian uh, group, the Syrian uh -huh. uh, Neurosurgical Society, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah. was led by Dr. Minyawi and some others, if you yeah. remember. Yeah. I, I was a secretary and, for eight years. For the, exactly, yeah. and you presented uh, one or two cases of uh, colloidal endoscopic treatment, and mm -hmm. I have done two already at that time, but you. You presented a nice lecture at that time. Well, I, I just have a small comment on your comment. Uh, when we are putting the shunt for uh, the colloid cyst, we are closing the space. Yes. Well, uh, as I said, I'm not advocating. I'm exactly like Dr. Sobejo is telling. I'm not advocating the VP shunts as a treatment for such patients. But in some special circumstances, in the, in the time that we are having in Syria now, there are plenty of patients or plenty of centers. They don't have facilities for complex surgeries. Uh, they need to go to Turkey, they need to go to Jordan, they need to go somewhere else. So if any surgeon who can manage such patient to tolerate the trip, I think this should be done. And yeah. then later on, as a surgeon, if I want to go endoscopically, I can just go and clamp, put a clamp for this uh, VP shunt, okay, close it, uh, and observe the patient for a couple of days. And when the ventricles are redilated no, no, again, no. Your I, patient I, I, will be I'll with go, go with endoscopy. Excuse yes, me? Yes, I have some big cases. If you close the, the shunt, the patient will be shunt dependent. And within a few hours, the patient will be comatose. Mm -hmm. It's very risky to close the shunt. For shunt dependent, uh, you, yeah. I have tried this one time. Well, it, I, I, it, okay, I, I, I almost you, lost my patient. No. Well, if you put the PP shunt for a long period, mm -hmm. for more than months, two or three months, I agree with you. But if the patient was having hydrocephalus and you treated this hydrocephalus with a medium pressure shunt or a little bit high pressure shunt uh, or programmable ones, I think still you can have the time for one or two days, three days 
until you will have dilatation for the ventricles, and then you can go endoscopically or surgically and treat this patient. I mean, uh, I, I cannot accept that my patient will come from here, and I will leave her doing nothing for her to go to Dr. Subeh or to come to you or to come back to me because she has no other circumstances except doing that, and then she will have a rest. I will not forgive myself all my life. Okay. Yes, yes, but I, I want to tell you something that I, I learned my endoscopy in Saudi Arabia. I attended three times in 1995, 96 with Gab and uh, Berniski for three years, and then I bring it to Syria. This is nice. Well, I, 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 learned, I learned endoscopy in France with St. George. I went to Gab himself and stayed about one month and a half with him for endoscopy, and I've done plenty of cases. And, well, believe me, the, 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 I'm sorry, I'm elongating this discussion, Dr. Subeh, but still, uh, uh, in some special circumstances, as Dr. Subeh agreed also, maybe we have to do that. Maybe. Yes. maybe. Yes. Some, some cases you have to put a shunt, no doubt about it, but it is, should not be the, the common practice. It should not be the rule. I agree totally, the yes. The majority of practice, I agree. Very good. Any closing comments or questions? Go ahead. Yes, Mo, I, I Mo, have, I have, Hold I on. Let, let, let's, let's give someone else a chance. Moha, no, but, go ahead. Go ahead, Moha. Could you go ahead? Moha, yes. you had a comment? Go ahead. My, my question is from Professor Ibrahim. Is that uh, what's your opinion if we, uh, we consider surgery for the every little uh, tum subependymal tumors around the foramen uh, area, especially fornix. Also, there is uh, some import uh, around the foramen monro. Yeah, and also, you told that some of these tumors will be vascularized and there is uh, danger for the future of the surgery. Mm. And also you consider that it would be in the future, we consider because of hydrocephalus, we consider arresting for the patient and mediasis for the patient. So my opinion is, and what's your opinion, if we consider surgery, early surgery for every small little room, for uh, damaging for right. I, I got can you can you understand that at all, Doctor Sabia? Yeah. I did not hear all the, the the what he said, but I think he's just asking whether there is a place for going for small lesions of sega, subependymal giant cell astrocytoma before they get larger. I'm against that. I don't operate on something asymptomatic, which is not causing any problem. If it is not causing hydrocephalus, usually it is asymptomatic. And these patients are going to develop some subependymal nodules here and there. So I leave it to, the, to, to deal with the culprit of the symptoms of the patient. But I would never operate on a patient who is asymptomatic. OK, very good. OK, well, we're going to close it up, Dr. Sabaya. Thank you very much. Do you Thank have you. any idea on the topic uh, next week? No, uh, but I will uh, shortly tell you about the topic, and we'll do it next Wednesday, inshallah. Dr. Bennett, I have I have a small comment only, please. OK, go ahead. Three, in the last three sessions, we had problems to enter into the, uh, to the Zoom program, to the Zoom. Uh, program. Yeah, we'll talk about that after, OK? Each, okay. each time it's telling that you are yeah, we'll, on another, on another yeah, uh, session. Yeah, we'll talk. OK, I understand. We'll, we'll talk about that after, OK? Sure. OK, thanks, everyone, for coming. And um, we'll wrap this up. We'll Thank see you, you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. OK, yeah, OK. We can, we can talk about it now because we're all kind of off the air and stuff, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I realized that you tried to get in, you couldn't get in. It said you had the wrong uh, address. Is that what you, you said, Abdallah? No, no, it's, it's, it's not saying that there is a wrong address. It's saying that the host is in another meeting. OK. And that happened this week uh, until uh, maybe five minutes after eight or something like that last week and the week before. And uh, I had to go through other channels until I was able to come in again. Uh, so yeah, usually, usually you, you, you cannot get in here unless I've already opened the room. Uh, that may be the problem. If, you, if the room is not open, you're not going to be able to get in. 
Uh, so well, uh, but gen generally I start it like 15 minutes, a half hour before, and then you can come in. That's, that's no, but usually today, today, by, today, by example, it was five minutes past eight and it was not open. Uh, last week, uh, it was about two minutes past, uh, past the time of, of start of the session. And the uh, week before, I was not able to attend at all uh, due to that. And then I saw it on the, on the YouTube. Oh, okay. So, uh, well, so if I, you I, saw it on YouTube, uh, it worked and there were people there. I can't explain why it happens occasionally, uh, but most people are successful in getting in. Uh, well, there are people I, that I don't, don't know what's I don't know what's happening, but it's always telling me that you are on another session. Really? The host, the host is on another session. You know what? I, I really don't know what's going on there. I don't know much about Zoom and how it at works. What, I don't know. At really what time do. you enter today? At what time do you open the room today? What time did I open this today? Yeah. Uh, we open this at one, about 1 o'clock, one, 108. We started a little late. Uh, okay. That's why maybe. Yeah, that, right. that anyway. could, yeah, we yeah we did start late. I would like I would like really to thank your efforts. I'm following plenty plenty of lectures and plenty of YouTube's uh, from the Neurosurgical TV. Oh, you I should see. Uh, did you see Dr. Ibe's lecture? the last hour. It was excellent. A bunch. Uh, we had a no, bunch of neurosurgeons from all well, over the place. I, I'm uh, I'm not receiving uh, plenty of of uh, emails. Well, oh, listen. You, do I have your email address? Because uh, well, uh, I don't know if you have it. You should go ahead. Write it. it. Write it in the uh, chat box here. Uh, because we'll do because we chat. have a mailing list. We mail. Uh, we you know pretty. I'm pretty good about that. Usually, I, I I send out emails to everyone that's on the list with every live conference. Well, it's there already now. Uh, okay. So did it, you it, did it, you? It is, you, did you uh, type it no, in there? Uh, uh, just type it in the chat box there. Do you know where the chat box is? Yes, I did it already. It's already in the chat box. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Abdallah, okay. Okay. So you, Abdallah okay. Zidane, hotmail.com. Okay, I'll make sure you're on that list and you'll be getting them. So, and everyone else, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you and, very much, uh, Dr. Bennett. Thank you okay. for all the reports. Okay, thanks for participating. Okay, very good. Bye-bye.